Hello, everyone. Our next speaker is Simon Bennett, and he's going to talk about how application developers can improve their security using the Z attack proxy. Hi, folks. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Great. Uh, my name is Simon Bennett, and I'm here to talk to, talk to you about um, using the OAuth Z attack proxy, otherwise known as ZAP, and how you can use it, um, particularly within development and QA, functional testing. Uh, before I get started, I've got a couple of questions for you guys. First one is, uh, has anyone here heard of OWASP before this weekend, before coming here? Well, that's pretty good. Uh, has anyone heard of ZAP before this weekend? A few of you, good. Uh, anyone actually used ZAP? Not very many. Okay, no, that's fine. That's what I was expecting, so I don't have to adjust my talk too much. Um, but if you've got any questions, you can shout them out now, or I will ask them at the, um, as, uh, at the end. Okay, so my name's Simon Bennett. Uh, I'm the Z Attack Proxy ZAP project lead, and I work for Mozilla in their security team. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you um, a very brief overview of ZAP, uh, assuming you know nothing at all about it, which is the case in mo for most people. Um, then I'm going to give a demo. Um, and after that, I'll talk a bit more about uh, some of the functionality. But I'm you know, going to do a demo. I know it's dangerous to do live, but what the hell. So I'm going to start off with the obvious question, which is what is that? And it is a tool for finding vulnerabilities in web applications. So if you're not interested in the security of web applications, then you're probably in the wrong talk. It is, so it's a tool for doing penetration tests. Um, and it's, the, one of the main things is, or one of, one of the key things is, it's easy to use. We're trying to make it as easy to use as possible. It is obviously completely free and open source, otherwise they wouldn't have let me in here. And it's an OWASP flagship project. So quite a few of you have heard of OWASP, but some of you haven't. So it's the Open Web Application Security Project. We've got a stand, um, which I'm on when I'm not here. Um, so if you want to learn more, please come over and say hi to us. So we can tell you all about it. Uh, but there are quite a few OWASP projects. So there's things like the top 10, um, which is the top 10 vulnerability uh, risks in web applications. Um, so there are a whole load of projects. Some are more mature than others. And there's a small set of flagship projects, including the top 10 and including Zap. And these are projects which are considered to be the most mature and the, most, the, the ones you should really look at first. And it is ideal for beginners. Um, that, that's a very, uh, there's a good reason for that, is I don't really consider myself to be a security expert. My background is in development. I started playing around with Zap as a way to teach myself about security. I realized I didn't know enough, and I wanted to learn more, and the only way I really learn is by cutting code. So I started cutting code, sort of playing around with things, and I started talking to other people who I uh, work with and realizing they didn't know enough about security. I started giving security talks um, to developers, functional testers, and one of the first questions I got asked by developers and QA people is, what tools should we use? Because developers, we like tools, don't we? Yes, no, yes, we do. Um, and so I had a look around, and I, what I wanted to do, I wanted to recommend a tool which was effective and easy to use and free and open source. And I looked around and I couldn't find anything that I looked, thought was suitable. In fact, the closest thing I found was um, a tool called Paros, Paros Proxy. Did anyone here use it? A few of you? Um, it's a really nice little tool. Trouble is it hadn't been updated for years. Um, so it's very out of date, but it's written in Java. It's quite simple. So I started playing around with it, teach myself. And some things annoyed me and it wasn't doing things. So I started developing myself, started coding things, started changing it, and I realized that this was actually the closest tool to the tool that I would like to recommend to other developers. So I fought Paros and created the Z-Attack proxy. So it, the, it's always been a focus for me to be aimed at beginners and people who are new to application security. However, the thing that really surprised me is that it seemed to be security professionals who took it up first. And this was not what I intended. Uh, I didn't, ex I didn't think that I could actually write a tool that um, professional pen testers would use, because I, didn't, because I certainly wasn't one. Uh, I am now, uh, I work for the Mozilla security team, so I am, I suppose, a security professional. 
Um, but people are using it. A lot of professional security teams are using it. So it goes from the whole range, from, from beginner right up to professional. So it's actually a really good tool to learn with. because so you can teach yourself, and it, you can actually start using more features as you learn more about security. But I, I still, one of my focuses is to make sure that it's really ideal for developers and functional testers. And one of the things that I'm really keen on is automated security testing. Uh, and that's something, so that's something I'm going to talk about later. And the other thing, it is becoming a framework for advanced testing. So there are, there's a lot of things that you can do, and it, you can actually carry on doing some very sophisticated things, and it's going to get more sophisticated as time goes on. We're still going to try and make sure it's as easy to use as possible. So a few of the principles behind Zap. Uh, mentioned free and open source. That's, that's very important to me. Um, and involvement is very actively encouraged. There are quite a few uh, open source projects which are very tightly controlled by one individual or a company. And I don't have a problem with that. If you release code as open source, and how you manage it is entirely up to you. But I do think the power of open source really comes from when you, anybody can contribute. Anyone can get involved and take it in, a, in directions that um, the originators might not expect. So I've always said that Zap is a community-oriented project. It's very easy to get involved. Uh, if anyone here wants to get involved, please do. Just contribute some decent code, and we'll give you commit access. It's that easy. So a lot of my time is spent trying to make sure that people can contribute and help people con to contribute. If it takes me an hour to help somebody to write a feature that I could do in half an hour, I will take that hour to make sure, because then that person will learn something and hopefully contribute more. And it's cross-platform. It's written in Java, so as long as you've got a JVM, then it'll run. I know Java's got a bad rep at the moment, um, but that's Java in the browser. Java on the server side and on, as, as a platform is, is OK, trust me. Uh, easy to use. This is something that is still very important to me. I wanted it easy to use, one, because it's aimed at beginners, partly aimed at beginners anyway. And the other thing is, I don't like tools that are difficult to use. I want tools that are intuitive and do what I want to do, what I want to do and the way I want to do, to do things. So easy to use is important. I realize that developers, you know, even if they start using Zap, well, they shouldn't be anyway, because otherwise they'd be doing security work. So it should be just picking it up occasionally, so it should be as easy as possible to go, all right, what I do, oh yeah, I remember this. And it should be intuitive and straightforward. And one thing we do is, if you have problems, you can raise them as you know, ease of use problems, you can raise them as issues, and we treat those just as serious as functional issues. issues. So ease of use is very important to us. And it's easy to install. I do install quite a, few, a lot of um, open source security tools. Some of them are a complete nightmare, so many dependencies and things, and it's something that can be really difficult to get working. As long as you've got a Java 7 JVM, that's all you need to run. And it is internationalized. Uh, I'm always surprised at the number of client programs which are only available in English. Uh, this seems bizarre to me. Uh, my background is in um, server-side development and web development. And I just couldn't bear putting hard-coded strings in the code. So I started internationalizing the stuff I was written, writing. And then I just went back and internationalized all the old Paros code. So Zap is now completely internationalized. And it's been translated into 13 other languages now. We use crowdin.com, which is free for open source projects, which is great. So anyone can get involved. If you'd like to help the translation or translate to a new language, then just get in touch. And, and you, know, you, can just, you don't have to even ask permission. Just get stuck in. And it is fully documented. Uh, one of the things, I mean, I evaluate a lot of um, open source projects. And one of the first things I do is I look at the documentation. I don't actually want to read it, because I want to use tools that are intuitive and easy to use. But I want to know that the documentation is there. Because you know, if the tool is actually good and useful, then you'll always start pushing the boundaries. It's good to know that you can actually, there is documentation. The documentation, pretty much every feature in Zap, I'm not going to claim it's the best documentation ever. You know, we're developers, we're writing it ourselves. Um, but you know, if you have any problems, let us know. And we'll try and explain things or improve that documentation. It also works well with other tools. So it's very important. Um, for me to, to make sure that Zap plays well with us, because I know that 
it's part of a, it really should be part of an in infrastructure. I want to be able to make sure that it can fit in with other tools that specialize in particular things. So that will never be everything to everybody, everyone. It's got a purpose, and I don't want to deviate too far from that, so I want to make sure that it works well with other security tools and other developer tools. And reuse is another thing which I think is very important, uh, and doesn't seem to get used very much in security tools, which surprised me when I started looking at them. So wherever possible, we try and reuse well-regarded libraries, particularly security libraries, rather than reinventing the wheel every time. So why use that? Um, basically, if you write web applications, anyone here write web applications? Thought you might do. Right, if they're on the internet, they will be attacked. If they're on an intranet, they'll be attacked as well. People are attacking your applications every day, all, all days. And the question is, who will find the vulnerabilities? It is really difficult to write good, fully functional web applications that have no vulnerabilities. If you just have a look at the number of vulnerabilities found in very well-known websites, you know, and the, the websites of, of applications of companies who have the best developers going. So, I mean, you saw Twitter and things like that. You know, it is really hard to write applications with no vulnerabilities. So the big question is, who is going to find them? And it could be a security researcher, which is good as long as they tell you, give you some warning. I mean, you might, maybe you get some pen testers in, but if you're writing open source software, you probably can't afford to get pen testers in. Or it could be the bad guys, which is, of course, the worst case. The best case is that you find them, and you find them early. And finding things early is really key, because if you do get, I mean, if you actually get pen testers in, typically you get them in, you know, a week or two weeks before you go live. And if they find serious problems, do you go live with those, or do, do you actually then rework it and put the, your delay your um, go live date, which is obviously could cost your company money or what, or could make it much more ha harder for you to do business. Whereas, and of course, the worst case is actually finding vulnerabilities in applications that have gone live because if you get compromised, your users get compromised. But the best thing to do is to find these vulnerabilities, ideally in development, so that you can actually find them and find out the causes and fix them as soon as possible, and before you have too many more vulnerabilities at the same, same time. And this may be a little bit controversial, but I think that attacking applications actually does make you a better developer. I'm kind of biased, I know, but I started looking at penetration testing to teach myself about what the attackers would do. I believe that you can't write secure software unless you know how it's going to be attacked. And tools like that can help you find that out. Right, now for the risky bit. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to be using a vulnerable web application. Uh, it's called the Budget Store. It's free and open source. Uh, it's on Google Code. So it's an application I wrote a few years ago um, for, for a course that I was running on security. And of course, I'm using the ZAttack proxy. So that's what it looks like. So we have a, we released Zap, a new version of Zap 2.0.0 this week, just Wednesday gone. Uh, I wanted to get out before this conference, um, so it was very deliberate timing. Um, so this is what it looks like now. If any of you have se seen it before, one of the things you'll notice which is different is this new Quick Start tab. So that is obviously aimed at people um, who are relatively new to security. And um, what you can do is you can just type in the URL that you want to attack. And luckily, I've already got it in there. And you press attack. Nice and straightforward. Now, what you'll see it done very quickly there, the first thing it does is it spiders the application. So it takes the URL that you've typed in, and it accesses that URL, then it tries to find all the links and, and crawls your website from there to find as much about the website as possible. And then it does the attacking. So what it's actually do doing now is active scanning. This is the real attacks. We also do passive scanning. So while you're browsing, proxying through Zap, or spidering, we're actually looking at all the requests and responses to see whether there are things we can problems we can detect just looking at the, uh, the requests and responses. But certain types of attacks, things like cross-site scripting and SQL injection, you can only find, really find if you actually do attacks. And this is what Zap has been doing just now. One thing I should stress is that you should only do these sort of tests on applications that you either own or you've been given permission to attack. 
Otherwise, you're breaking the law. I told you not to do it, okay? That's my get out of jail free card. <laughs> so, Zap has now spidered the application and has done some attacks. And we'll see down here, there are a whole set of alerts. So alerts are vulnerabilities or potential vulnerabilities. I say potential vulnerabilities because we are, we're automating this, and, and so you can never, you know, it's always worth double checking. So we have a look down here, and we have a cross-site scripting vulnerability. And if you double click on these things, you actually get a pop-up with loads more information. So it'll actually tell you, give you a full description of what the, thing, what the vulnerability is, and a solution as well, and you can get web um, HTML or an XML report out of this as well. But what we can see is, you can see the request, and you can see the response. And um, what we've actually got here highlighted is the, the evidence of the attack. And you clear, see quite clearly I've been able to inject a script. And you can open that in a browser and it'll get a pop-up. So that is proof that we actually have a vulnerability in this application. So what I recommend is that you, you, know, you can, to get started, you've got a very quick option. You can actually just go to a quick start, put in your URL, and attack it. Is that easy enough for you? OK. So if it was this easy, that would be kind of the end of the talk. Um, it's never that easy. Uh, application security is quite tricky. Um, it's very tricky, in fact. And there are some limitations to this. An obvious one, if you've got a login page, hopefully Zap won't be able to log in quite so simply, so you won't actually see any of the application at all. Um, and the other thing is, the spider uh, is effective, but it's, it could always better be better. So an automated tool never understands the context of what it's looking for and what it's actually doing. So it will supply dummy values, which typically means you won't explore an application fully. Um, an obvious thing is where you have to register a user, you'll see a form, and you'll put Fred in. And the um, Zap will put in 123 or whatever it does. And you get an error message back saying, this must be an email address. You go, OK, it must be an email address, fred at gmail.com. Fine. And then you've, you've registered. Whereas Zap will just go, right, nothing came, of interest came back and move on. So it's actually much more effective to uh, have, have a person exploring the application. So when you're actually doing a penetration test as a security professional, what you normally do is you get a browser and you proxy that through a tool like Zap. And you explore the application. And that's very, that's good from point of view that you actually, you start learning about the application as well. But you're also essentially teaching Zap how to drive that application. And it'll exp you'll be able to explore much more of the application. Then you run the automated tools, uh, the attacking, and then you can start doing the manual tests. Now that's all well and good. Um, and you can, as developers, you can do that. And I've, I've um, worked with QA teams before. I said, well, you know, you're testing this thing manually. Why don't you actually just proxy through Zap? You'll explore the application much more effectively and then do the automated um, attacking, which is great. But as a developer, this takes some time. And it's, it's manual. It's not great. So I'll just take a little diversion here. And I'll talk about regression tests. As a developer, I'm a big fan of regression tests. They basically test that you haven't messed things up. You don't say, right, the regression tests are passed, we'll ship. No, you're doing, going to do some manual tests as well. You do some sanity checks. But if the regression tests pass and you've got a good set of regression tests, then uh, you have at least some warm feeling that you haven't really messed up. And if you're dealing with web applications, it's a fairly, a fairly good way of testing them now. And you can have something like a build tool, whether it's Jenkins or Ant or Maven or anything like that, driving something um, like Selenium, driving a browser, which drives the web application. And you can have your unit test as well. But unit test just tests small parts, whereas something like Selenium is actually testing the application that the user sees. It's no good if all the individual bits work, but the whole thing is broken. You want to make sure that the, what the user is actually seeing works properly. So has anyone here got that sort of set up? Yeah, fair few of them. Right, that's good. And this is a really great way of doing functional testing. And it's good because developers who are writing these things and QA people who are writing these things understand the application and understand what it should be doing and what it shouldn't be doing. 
So a lot of people have these sort of functional tests. What would be really great is we had security regression tests. Now, these are much harder. They're actually very hard to write. Um, and particularly as developers and QA people often don't, have a, have a, you know, don't specialize in security, don't really understand it. Um, but what would be really great is if we could actually magically change these regression tests, uh, UI regression tests, into security tests. And my suggestion is what you can do is you can proxy, so you've got Selenium driving your browser of choice, which of course is Firefox, um, through that. So essentially what you're now doing is you are exploring your application using these tests. So you're teaching Zap how the application works and how it should be driven so it can explore everything. And then what you can do is you can get your build tool to talk directly to Zap. Because we have a REST API, uh, and so you can actually kick off things like the spider and the active scanner, and then get the details of the vulnerabilities back. So you can run your user tests and then run your security tests. And I will hopefully give a demo of that. First of all, I will clear this. So what I have here is uh, Eclipse, and hopefully, What I'm going to do is kick off a set of functional, functional Selenium tests. And this is the interesting bit where you just wait and see if anything happens. And something's happening. I'm feeling relieved already. So what we're doing now is Selenium is driving the browser, which very hopefully is proxying through Zap. And so essentially what you're doing is you're converting functional tests into security tests. Um, what I'm doing. Um, part of my job at Mozilla is we are d p putting this in place. So I'm working with a QA team. Is the QA team here? Dave, anyone? Is he around? I can't see him. So, um, yeah, he's over there. So I'm working with um, the Mozilla um, QA team. So we're actually embedding this and making sure that what we're doing is having all of our functional tests going all the way through. And so it's probably just gone through there. The functional tests worked. and but the security tests fail. So if I scroll up, I don't know if you can read this or not. But we have the tests run, run there successfully. We then kicked off the spider and pulled the status line. And then kicked off the active scanner and got the alerts back. So again, we can see, go to the history page, all the history come through there, and the alerts, we have a whole set of alerts now. So the idea is you can actually put, include this as part of your continuous integration. So you check some code in, um, and maybe you, know, you, for, you forget to escape something, or it's somebody new on your project who doesn't understand how this should work, and you forget to, you know, you escape to, it's, Forget to escape a, some user input when you're reflecting it, when you're putting it back out onto the, to the page. Um, and a few hours after you've checked that in, your functional tests run, they get proxied through Zap, Zap runs a whole load of attacks on it, and you get an email alert to say that you've now got a cross-site scripting vulnerability in your application, hours after you've actually checked the code in, as opposed to after it's gone live. So what I will do now is just quickly. Well, so Zap has this REST API. And OK, it could be better documented. We have some documentation. But one thing we do have is we have a UI around it. Um, so this is automatically generated. And you can explore the different components. So we can have a look at things like the core. Uh, and these are all of the things you can look at. So let's have a look at the alerts. And I will just have look at the first two alerts. XML is probably easier. And so 
that URL is the one you, actually, you can actually use. So this shows you all the operations that are available, and you can, so you can actually try it out um, manually before you actually have to go in and um, drive it programmatically. We have got documentation online as well, um, but browsing it that way is probably the easiest way. We also have um, Java and Python libraries, so those get automatically generated as well. And if you actually like uh, any other client libraries, then get in touch. If you can actually write the, you know, a simple ca test case um, with one operation, then I can probably get the, generate the code for all the others. Uh, it's much easier generating the code for these things rather than actually having to write them manually. I like making things easy for myself. And loads more information online about this. <coughs> uh, now, that, what, what I showed you looked very straightforward and very easy, but uh, to actually get it embedded and to get it working well uh, is non-trivial. A lot of people are, are working on this right now, so I'm working with a lot of other companies who are, are doing this too. So if you want to do this kind of thing at your company or with your open source project, then get in touch with me. I mean, obviously, you can just try it out, but please get in touch. Um, because obviously we've got some experience in this and also you're gonna come up with new ideas and new suggestions and I can implement them or I can help you to implement them, which is even better from my point of view. So what I'd like to talk to, to, talk to you about now is some of the main features of Zap. It is an intercepting proxy. This is where it started out. So the typical way it used to be um, used and the way it is used in security teams is you tell your browser to proxy through Zap, and then you can see, um, so Zap can see everything that you can see the requests and responses, and you can intercept them, you can change them, and you can all run a whole load of fun tools, and you can fuzz things and do lots of interesting things. It's got active and passive scanners. So the passive scanner just looks at the requests and responses and works out whether, you know, it, there's certain things you can tell that you haven't got um, certain headers in place, or you have uh, things like, you know, you're not putting HTTP only on your cookies, things like that, which we can tell. Look, just look at the, the code, the HTML, and go, yep, you're vulnerable. You've got simple vulnerability. Um, the active scanner, that's the one that actually does the attacking. Um, so, and again, don't use that on any applications apart from ones you own or ones that uh, you have permission to test. It's got what I call a traditional spider. Um, so, and that's the one you saw very briefly earlier. So it goes, to, examines all the links and just keeps on sp um, following those links, finding all the different um, areas of your application. This is good because it's really fast, but it's not so effective. If you've got an application that uses a lot of AJAX, um, so a lot of JavaScript, then it can, it can have problems. You know, if you're generating links with JavaScript, traditional spiders have a lot of problems with that. So what we've done is we've now got a new AJAX spider. And what that does is it actually, again, uses Selenium to drive a browser, and that finds, uh, and then that user is actually using a project called Crawljax. And so that actually explores the application based on the links generated for your browser. So as long as you've actually got things to click on, and hopefully your application has, otherwise it's not a very useful one, um, then Zap will explore that, will find that, all that content. So if you've got an Ajax application, then it, the Ajax spider is the ideal one to use for that. The reason we say don't use it all the time is it's much slower. Because obviously, it's, you know, it, we've got a browser there, and it's essentially clicking on things and getting responses back, whereas the traditional spider is much faster. We've also got WebSocket support. Is anyone here using WebSockets yet? A few of you. Right. One thing, I, I, used to, I use Zap sometimes as a debugging tool just when developing things. It's really useful if you've got uh, some library, uh, Ajax type library, and you want to see what's going on, what the requests and responses are, or maybe you've made a mistake and you want to change some of how the application works, just change some of the parameters being sent. You can do that on the fly with Zap, so you can use Zap as a debugging tool. If you're doing web, using WebSockets, you really need to use Zap. I think Zap's got the best um, WebSocket support of any security tool, open source or commercial. Uh, we had one of the Google Summer of Code guys over the last summer implemented this. So you, actually, you can intercept, you can see all of the WebSocket communications, you can intercept them, so you can change them on the fly, you can send new ones, you can even fuzz them. Um, so if you're doing any WebSocket support, do check out Zap and have a play with that. And if you have any problems with it, let us know. 
Force browsing. So this is where you developers sometimes create URLs that, and they don't have any links to them, so they think that the bad guys won't find them. Um, the bad guys can because they use tools, things like OWASP Durbuster, which is a, which does force browsing. It just tries loads of lift, loads of permutations. So again, as part of reuse, we're using the Durbuster code uh, and, and the libraries, so we can do so you can actually find pretty much any URL, look, however well hidden it is. And we've got fuzzing as well. And in Zap terms, the, auto, the automated scanner, the, the active scanner, does targeted attacks and looks for particular types of vulnerabilities. But we know that sometimes you can't find all the vulnerabilities that way. And so with fuzzing, you can actually choose what you're going to attack and how you're going to attack it with different fuzzing libraries. That's probably more for the security folk. Uh, but, you know, if you're, if you're really keen on that as a developer, it's well worth playing around with. And the other key thing, um, one of the big changes in the release has just gone out, is this online add-ons marketplace. No idea where I got the idea of an online add-ons marketplace from, but the idea is you, um, what I'm trying to do is make it as easy as possible to extend Zap and for anyone con to contribute to it. And one of the ways is by creating add-ons, and we'll host those, and you can actually look at dynamic, you can see what's there, you can browse them from within Zap, you can download and install them dynamically. And actually, one of the other things is all the tests we're using for the active and passive scanners are implemented as add-ons. And of course, you can download them, and you can up update those automatically, which is kind of useful if you're a security person. But if you've got Zap as part of your continuous integration, you can actually download the latest plugins before you run your tests automatically. And that means you might come in one morning, and you haven't actually changed the code, but if we've improved some of the tests or added new ones, then you can actually be told about a vulnerability that you didn't, know, you didn't actually know you had, and it's been in the, co in the code for some time, but because we've got new tests, you, it'll now, they will now find it. So here's some features that, I mean, they're not always specifically aimed at developers, but ones which are, may well be of use to you. There's a quick start tab that I mentioned earlier, or showed you earlier, so it's nice and easy. Here's the URL, go attack it. The REST API. Uh, some security people are using it as well to interact with other security tools, but really when I created this, I was thinking mostly about developers and QA and integrating within um, continuous integration environments. So that's the real, that was the initial focus on this. And we've extended the REST API in 2.0.0, so there's, actually, you, there's a whole load of that functionality that you actually drive via this API. My plan is to get it so we actually you can do pretty much anything via the API as well. So we've got Java and Python clients. So I mean, if you've got any other language, obviously, you can just use the API, APIs directly. Uh, and we support both JSON and XML. You just change something in the URL, and you're both of those supported. But obviously, the clients make it easy for some people. And I said, if you want any other language supported, any other scripting languages, or any other languages, let me know. We have a headless mode. Um, Zap obviously started off as, well, uh, Paros was just a UI, but we've now got a daemon mode. So if you're actually running this on a continuous integration server and you don't have, you know, don't have a uh, screen connected to anything, and you actually, you know, if you're using or uh, just driving API, you don't need the screen, so just run it um, in daemon mode so you don't see, any, don't see anything. We've got anti-CSRF token handling, um, cross-site request forgery. Anyone heard of those? If you haven't and you're developing web applications, then you really ought to have a look at them um, and pop by the OWASP stand and we'll tell you all about them. Uh, but the trouble is, when I um, do security testing, I, whenever I come across these things, it's kind of a mixed blessing. It's good because it means developers understand, the developers understand that these are problems and how to fix them. But it also means they often hide loads of different other problems because a lot of security tools can't cope with them. So they will try and submit things to forms again, and those, those posts will fail because the right token hasn't been generated. What Zap does is Zap detects tokens. Nice, simple regex, so you know, it might not know your particular token, but you can just put that in. So Zap will, but then Zap will detect where it's, where it's generated and where it's used. And when you're doing either fuzzing or active scanning, there's an option to actually regenerate these tokens for you. Uh, so I implemented that when I was testing one application which used these, and it just found a whole load of new vulnerabilities that opened up because Zapna handles anti-CSRF tokens. Another thing it handles, with one of the new features, is, is authentication. And this is at an early stage, but it's something we're going to work on a lot. 
Um, so via the UI, you can define how an application authentic authenticate, how the browser authenticates the application. At the moment, we just handle form, simple forms, but we're going to extend that as much as possible. Um, and you can tell it that how to detect whether something, whether an application is logged in or not. And then you can say, well, if the app isn't logged, if your browser isn't logged in, log in automatically, which is kind of a little trick via the UI, but it's actually essential when you start doing um, the auto automated regression tests. Because um, if, if you just use the regression tests, then your regression tests, if they keep you logged in, that's fine. But a lot of tests are nice standalone ones. Log in, do something, log out. And of course, if Zap then tries to reuse that session, it's just going to hit the login page. But you could obviously configure this via the API, and then you can say, right, here's how to authenticate to this application, and then run the test. And then when Zap starts trying to do the active scanning, it'll go, I'm not logged in. I will log in, get a new session, and carry on from there. Um, the auto updating, as I mentioned before, so that's, that means that particularly when in continuous integration, you can pull down the very latest changes um, before you doing it before we actually do any testing. Another thing, um, which is again, probably a more of people are new to secur security, is the modes. Actually, I might be able to show those. So we have a standard mode. Um, the standard mode is do anything. You can be as nasty as you like. Um, there's safe mode. And this is not one for the security people. But in safe mode, as the all the attacks are actually grayed out. So in safe mode, you can't do anything nasty. Now, that can actually be useful if you're looking at a, a, um, a li one of your production sites or a site that you don't own. You can still use a passive scanner. So that will do all the passive scanning and let you see what's going on, but it won't allow you to do any attacks. So it's kind of, it keeps, you know, it makes sure you don't do any damage. And there's also a protected mode, and for this, Again, you won't be able to do anything nasty until you actually tell Zap what you want to attack. So what you can do is you can say, we have this idea of contexts. So context is actually just a set of regular expressions. So you can, and you can say which ones are included and which ones are excluded. So you can actually say, this is what makes up my application. Um, and then once you've said that, by default, it's in scope. So we have this our concept of scope. So contexts are typically individual applications. You may only have one context, but you may have multiple ones if you've got different applications on different machines, or just all on the same machine but doing different things. And you can say if they're in scope, then then get that target icon up here. And that means if you're in protected mode, you can still attack them, but not anything outside that context. And actually here, this is where we define the authentication, so you can give the login URL, the post data, and all that kind of things. You can also do a lot of these things by right clicks as well. If you are playing around with that for the first time, it's well worth right clicking on everything. So there's always a whole load of options that you've got from here. So you can from, you say it's a login request, log out request, all those kind of things. Some of the additional features, um, auto-tagging. Little example there. So Zap has a series of regular expressions, which you can add to as well. So it looks for certain things. So in this case, you can see very quickly that that particular form's got an anti-CSRF token. Kind of useful to see what's going on. Port scanner, that's not actually included as part of um, Zap standard now. I decided it wasn't quite relevant to what most people do. I, it's not Nmap, but it's, it's still it's convenient and it works pretty well. Um, but you can download that from the add-ons marketplace if you want it now. It's also got a script console. Um, this is quite fun if you want to get into more advanced stuff. So the script console basically gives you a window where you can type scripts in. And we support anything that Java supports. So you get JavaScript by default, but you can put in pretty much any, I think Java supports huge range, there's Python and Ruby, pretty much any scripting language is supported. And because we're an open source project, we don't, we don't have any secrets. So you can actually access all of the internals, all the internal data structures, 
can actually change the UI. You can go in and delete things. You can cause all sorts of havocs. Havoc. But the script console gives you really powerful access. And you can loop through um, the sites tree, the alerts. You can do anything you like. It's essentially the same as you're rewriting Zap on the fly. So if you want to get uh, in, involved deeply, that's, you can have a lot of fun there. Got report generation, so you get, well, that probably could be better, but it's easier to read reports. Um, smart card support. This is something I, Fred, I can't talk about a great deal um, because I've not really, really been involved in it, but some of the other Zap developers are, use smart cards a lot for authenticating to applications. So I'm told Zap has some of the best smart card support of any security tool. So context and scope, so you can now define different areas of the application or di different applications, or different um, things like the authentication and the properties of those applications. Session comparison. Now this is a kind of very simple thing. So you can actually have multiple, you can have use Zap with one particular user and then use Zap as another user and you can compare and see what they both can, um, what they can do and what they can't do and compare the URLs side by side. This is kind of very basic, um, but one of the things we've also got um, isn't on there. Um, we now support, have much better support for HTTP sessions. So Zap understands what um, sessions are. So actually see down here, um, Zap is keeping track of all the particular sessions you've got. So you can actually have multiple sessions open at the same time. You can open, you create a new session, so you're actually logged in as multiple users and can switch between them. And so that, that's actually, is, it's early days, but I think it's gonna be very powerful. And it's one thing I want to make sure is that we actually start being able to test access control much better. I don't think anyone does this very well, but we've got all the building blocks in place. Uh, so this is something that's gonna do a lot of work on in the, in the forthcoming months and years. You can also invoke external applications, so you can configure other applications that um, you want to invoke from Zap. One of the advantages of that is you can pass context across, so you can right-click in the Sites menu and invoke an application, and you can pass across whatever um, details across from the URL or um, the parameters. You can pass those across the application to make it as easy as possible. And you can import that information back in, any information that that application generates as well. And the other thing we've got is dynamic SSL certificates. So if your application um, uses HTTPS, uh, then one of the problems is typically browser, um, security tools will generate their own certificates. And of course, you know, then your browser will start complaining like crazy. What you can do within Zap is generate your own root CA certificate, and it is just for you, so it's not one standard one, it's your personal one. And then you can import that into your browser and trust that, and then so then Zap will be able to intercept the, the HTTPS communications, decrypt it, show what's going on, but your browser will still be happy. So one of the things is, is that it? You know, will Zap solve all your security needs? I'm afraid not. Um, security is very complex, and one thing, if you just use the automated features, you cannot detect all the vulnerabilities. There are certain sort of vulnerabilities that are relatively easy to detect by scanning, and some that aren't. Things like logical vulnerabilities. So there's a logical vulnerability in your application, then no tool is gonna to find that. So you do need somebody think, actually going through and looking at these things. And in the end, if you're serious about security, then, then you actually, if you're just testing for stuff at the, after you've developed, it's a bit late. You should be thinking about security all the way through. So you have to understand about security and what the types of vulnerabilities are and how to avoid them. So I th it also helps to understand how people will go about attacking your application. That's how I got involved. So knowing what the bad guys will do, then you can, maybe your application can actually detect it. Um, so one thing I think is really, if you have a good understanding of security, you should start thinking about making your application security aware, if it's relevant for your application, of course. So then an application can actually see when it's being attacked, maybe put some fields in there which aren't of hidden fields which are of no use, um, but are actually kind of canaries or hacker traps so you can see what's going on. And if somebody changes one of those, you know you're being attacked and lock them out or whatever. Um, and you, know, you really need to consider security throughout the development. So things like threat modeling, think about how an application could be attacked, and attack surface area reduction. Do you need all these facilities? Is a facility actually adding 
too many whole, potential holes to make it worth putting in there. <coughs> and static source code analysis, all these things are really good. Using security libraries, keeping the libraries up to date. I mean, if that's another talk, all this stuff is another talk in itself. I just wanted to make sure that you didn't think that Zap would be all you need. And a little bit about some OWASP resources that can help you. The top 10, so this is one of the most famous, uh, probably the most famous OWASP project, the top 10 application risks. So it explains very clearly what those risks are, how they can be exploited, and how you can avoid, uh, how you can prevent them from happening. Got an AppSex tutorial series. Has anyone looked at any of those videos? A few, not many. Have, they're on YouTube, they're linked off the OWASP site. They're really great introductions. Um, so three or four now. Hopefully there's going to be one on Zap fairly soon as well. So that's a really great series if you're new to application security. Cheat sheets. The cheat sheets are really good because they're, very, they're relatively small and consumable, so easily to get your head around. Um, there are things like the development guide and testing guide, which are great resources, but they're not, you know, they're hefty and not great fun to read. Um, good as reference guides, so. Um, ESAPI, e which is a library in, available in various um, different languages, which, which gives you a load of security features that you can make use of. Um, the Broken Web Application Project, BWA, this is a whole set of vulnerable web applications. So if you actually want to learn about application security, this is a great way to give you something to play around with, something to attack, something to legally um, break and hack, and to use Zap on, of course. Um, and there's loads more. So um, go to www.owos.org, um, and that will... And there's loads of great information there. Um, now, before any questions, one thing I would like to know, my last question for you, have I convinced any of you that it's worth downloading Zap and giving it a go? <laughs> Excellent. That's what I wanted to hear. Right, I'm going to be on the OWASP stand, so if you want to come and talk to me uh, in person, please do. Um, but before then, who's got the first question? Thank you. Um, I had a question about um, the list of parameters that, for instance, the that, for instance, the uh, cross-site scripting uses. For, uh, I saw in your uh, application that it was using uh, script tags and then an alert one, uh, but that's a relatively easy a form of cross-site scripting. Most of the times, so they will be more advanced than using. Uh, crazy setups like uh, open the script tags for four times or using uh, CSS tags and with JavaScript in them. Is there like a list of those fields or is it just okay. a simple one? So the, the way that detects cross-site scripting, uh, it will not find all, uh, it only looks for reflected cross-site sc scripting vulnerabilities and it won't find all of them, but what it does, it injects a safe token into each parameter in turn and then it looks to see whether that's reflected in the page and also tries a couple of error cases as well. So it then looks at where that occurs and looks at the context of it. So it looks to see which tags it's in, um, whether it's actually within a tag, whether it's within JavaScript, whether it's in comments, and it does a whole series of tests and what, which, whether it's quoted or not. So it actually does a whole series of tests targeting the particular context that each, everywhere it's reflected. So it actually gives a very low rate of false positives and is actually very effective. Um, I don't, there's a series of tests called WAVSEP, so I think they're the best, the most effective tests of web scanners that I'm aware of, open source one anyway. And Zap scores 100% finding the cross-site scripting and 0% on false positives. Now, I'm certainly not saying, that just shows it's good against those particular tests, but it is, in general, it's one of the more effective cross-site scripting vulnerability scanners, but it won't find everything, which is why we've got the fuzzing. So if you're suspicious of one particular field, then you can fuzz it with loads of bad stuff from loads of different libraries. Anybody else? Yes. Well, can you compare and contrast it, please, to the competition? WebScarab, Verb Proxy, others? Okay, fair enough. Okay, I will try and be as reasonable as possible, so if anyone disagrees with what I'm saying, shout out. 
There are a lot of tools in this space. The original iOS one was Web Scarab. Um, I actually looked at Web Scarab early on when I decided I wanted to do some open source work and thought about working on a tool. I thought about working on Web Scarab. Now, Web Scarab at the time hadn't been updated for a long time as well. It is being updated, but not very much. And I don't think I'm the only person who thinks it's quite a complex tool and not very intuitive. So I didn't want to, I decided it was easier to take a simple tool like Paros and add more functionality than take a hard, to, a difficult to use product like Web Scarab and make it easier to use. And also, it's, you know, I wanted to learn by doing things as well. So I think Web Scarab is harder to use. It's not as functional anymore. And there's very little work going on it. So there's loads of work going on on Zap. We're, ex we're doing a lot of stuff. Burp is a different matter. Burp is a really great tool. Um, so I'm not going to criticize it. Um, however, one, it's not open source. It's not free. It cost, doesn't cost very much. So you know, from a, it, it's actually well worth it. So, and it's a tool that I would expect professional pen testers to use. Having said that, I think professional pen testers should really understand all of the main tools and their strengths and weaknesses and use them accordingly. And I think Zap is now one of those tools. So if you're a professional pen tester and you haven't looked at Zap, you're doing yourself a disservice. But I certainly wouldn't expect the pros to use Zap all the time. But I think Zap is more, is more suitable and more effective for developers, functional testers, and people new to application security. Um. Okay, uh, I am really sorry, but unfortunately we are running out of time. So if, for any other question, you will probably can interrupt the, the speaker. And so thank you. And 